I was incredibly shy as a kid, painfully shy, to the point that my best friend in school, Natasha, had to accompany me to talk to our teachers about the smallest things. Sometimes she literally had to speak for me because I couldn't get the words out. The years went by, I came to the US, I learned to speak English, and Natasha remained over 4,000 miles away. She could no longer speak for me. I had to figure out a way to speak up for myself. So whenever I had to go talk to one of my terrifying teachers, or ask a question of a store clerk, or approach a stranger on the street for directions, this was way before cell phones and GPS, I instinctively did what I saw Natasha do before a tough conversation. I took a breath. This helped me feel more grounded and allowed my mouth to make words. Breathing remained my way of preparing to speak. In college, I fell in love with the study of psychology, in part because it helped me understand some of my own experiences and it helped explain the behavior of people around me. I went on to graduate school, became a clinical psychologist. It turns out, psychologists teach a lot of breathing. When you're feeling scared, overwhelmed, unable to speak, the one clear thought running through your mind, this is awful, now what? Turning to the breath feels right. But why does it help us feel more grounded in the face of a challenge? The breath is a gateway to your own personal superpower that acts as your best friend, helps you rise to the challenge and be at your best. The breath stimulates something called heart rate variability. Not to be confused with heart rate. Heart rate variability is key in allowing your body to respond to stress in healthier, more helpful ways. We can use the breath to train heart rate variability, to gain flexibility and resilience in the face of a challenge. Heart rate variability is that superpower that we all carry with us and can learn to harness when it matters most. Heart rate variability is the change in time that passes from one heartbeat to the next. If you were to take your pulse, go ahead, do it with me. On your wrist or on your neck, you would feel a thump, thump, thump. Each one of those thumps is a heartbeat. It's the left ventricle of your heart contracting, sending oxygenated blood out to your body. On the EKG, it is represented as the R peak. If you were to count those thumps or heartbeats, you would probably count somewhere between 60 and 80 of them in a minute. That is your heart rate. But the time that passes from one heartbeat to the next is changing all the time. Sometimes the space between heartbeats gets longer. The heartbeats are coming further apart and your heart rate is slowing down. And then space between heartbeats gets shorter your heartbeats come closer together, and the heart rate is speeding up. If your heart were to beat with 882 millisecond intervals at all times, your heart rate would be 68 beats per minute. And if your heart were to beat with 674 millisecond intervals at all times, your heart rate would be 89 beats per minute. Just like the time interval that passes from one heartbeat to the next is changing all the time. So does your instantaneous heart rate. Your heart rate is speeding up and slowing down, increasing and decreasing all the time. You'll see a plot of this on the next slide. Those increases and decreases of your heart rate are heart rate variability. The greater your heart rate variability, or HRV, the healthier and more resilient you are. Let me be clear, heart rate variability is not an increase in your heart rate when you're going for a run. Heart rate variability is a beat-to-beat -beat change in your heart rate that happens all the time, at rest or any other time. 
Your heart rate, averaged over a number of beats, may be the same. But heart rate variability, the way in which your heart rate accelerates and decelerates over that period of time, may be higher or lower. Here, you see two people's heart rate. The average heart rate for both of them is the same, about 70 beats per minute. What differentiates them is heart rate variability. The red signal is the plot of instantaneous heart rate, the way your heart rate goes up and down, representing heart rate variability. The blue signal is the breath, and we'll come back to that in a bit. For the person on your left, the heart rate varies from a high of about 85 down to a low of about 65 beats per minute for each cycle, for a maximum heart rate variability of about 20 beats per minute. For the person on your right, their heart rate varies from a high of only about 72 down to a low of about 67 beats per minute for each cycle, for a maximum HRV of only about five. Many people believe that a healthy heart works like a metronome, beating with the same pace all the time. That is, in fact, not so. It may seem counterintuitive, but a heart that beats with the same pace all the time has trouble being flexible and responsive to the changing demands of our daily lives. This counterintuitiveness is similar to how we think about skyscrapers. We tend to think of them as solid and immovable, but in fact, they're built with a lot of flexibility. They're designed to sway in the wind. The taller the building, the more sway it has. This is necessary in order for it to withstand the force of the wind. Your heart is built with similar innate flexibility. If you were faced with sudden danger, and your heart rate needed to increase quickly in order for you to be able to run away, your heart would have a much easier time doing that if your heart rate was already cycling through large increases and decreases. We're much better able to withstand the force of the winds that come at us if our hearts are flexible and agile. Heart rate variability is important because it determines your body's ability to regulate itself. It tells us how well you're able to respond to stress. Research shows that higher heart rate variability is strongly associated with better mental and physical health, greater resilience in the face of challenges, better mental and physical performance. People suffering from conditions like anxiety, depression, trauma, chronic pain, headaches, high blood pressure, gastrointestinal disorders, benefit from heart rate variability training. HRV training also helps us improve physical endurance and reaction speed, ability to make decisions and problem solve under pressure, and respond quickly and appropriately to sudden changes in our environment when life throws curveballs at us. Imagine that you're preparing for an important meeting with a person who may be difficult. You know the, the meeting would be difficult, and you think you are prepared. You know what you want to say and how you want to act. And as the meeting starts, it is indeed difficult. But unexpectedly, you are not able to follow through on what you had intended. Your heart is beating out of your chest, your stomach is tying itself in knots, and your thinking is cloudy. And you see yourself suing and seeing and doing and saying things you did not intend to say or do. Even as there is a voice in the back of your head saying, no, 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 don't do that, don't say that, you watch yourself going down that unhelpful trajectory as if on auto mode with the one clear thought in your mind. Oh no, now what? And the answer to that question is specific to each individual person. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. But there is one common denominator 
that runs through my response to my own challenges and my work with other people as a psychologist. That is heart rate variability training. I've worked with numerous people using HRV training, helping them navigate their way through anxiety, depression, consequences of trauma, chronic pain, medical conditions. I use HRV training successfully with people looking for a professional edge, whether it be getting better at presenting in front of others, staying collected and focused in a high-stakes negotiation, or being at your best in a championship game. Most of us are looking for that personal or professional edge, and heart rate variability training gives you exactly that. If you were to find yourself in that difficult meeting after a couple of months of HRV training, you would find that it's easier to respond in a helpful way. Things might still go wrong, and you would still feel stressed, but your heart would not beat out of your chest, your stomach would not tie itself in knots, and your thinking will remain clear enough to figure out how to respond. When I talk about HRV training, many, many people ask me, why do I have to do anything about my heart or my nervous system? Aren't they designed to work on their own? If you're wondering the same, you are indeed correct. Your heart and your nervous system do, do their own thing on their own, and they do a good enough job most of the time. But there is a but. One way to wrap your mind around this is to think about a DSLR camera one of those fancy cameras with a bunch of buttons and controls. Many of these cameras have an auto function. So you can set the camera on auto mode, point and shoot, and you will take decent pictures. But if you wanted to take really good pictures, then you need to train and learn how to use all those buttons and controls. Your heart and your nervous system will do a good enough job on their own much of the time. But if you want to be at your best as much of the time as possible, then heart rate variability training will give you that edge. The breath is the foundation for HRV training. The breath drives the heart rate. As you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. As you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. For each one of us, there exists an optimal rate of breathing that promotes maximum heart rate variability. The skill is called resonance frequency breathing. Resonance is a physics concept that describes the property of an oscillating system in which stimulations at specific frequencies produce maximum oscillation amplitudes. Your cardiovascular system is one such oscillating system. The breath stimulates the heart. And heart rate and resonance frequency breathing produces maximum oscillations of the heart rate, maximum heart rate variability. An easier way to think about the system is to compare it to pushing a child on the swing. There are lots of different ways to push that swing. You can push it infrequently and with a lot of force. It will go up, but not smoothly come down and not go up much after that. You can push it with short, frequent bursts, and it will go up just a bit and come right back down. In both of these scenarios, the child would not be pleased. Or you can find a regular, measured way of pushing the swing, allowing to go up as much as possible and come down as much as possible each time, maximizing the delight of the child. Your breath stimulates the heart rate in the same way as a person pushing that swing. Residence frequency breathing allows your heart rate to go up as much as possible on each inhalation, come down as much as possible on each exhalation. Over time, training your nervous system to become more flexible and more resilient. For most of us, resonance frequency breathing rate is somewhere between four and seven breaths per minute. Up until recently, if you wanted to do HRV training, you needed to find a certified professional who would use their uh, clinical-grade equipment to measure your HRV, determine your residence frequency breathing rate, and do training with you weekly in the office. And while there are still great reasons to see a trained professional, recent technological advances now allow you to bring HRV training home. 
there exist a number of devices that connect to phone apps, allowing you to make HRV training accessible and easily available at home. Depending on which app you choose, you'll be able to do some or all aspects of HRV training, from measuring your HRV and tracking its progress over time, to determining your resonance frequency breathing rate, to doing HRV training with biofeedback. Since it is not possible for us to determine all of your resonance frequencies right now, let's practice breathing at six breaths per minute. That rate gets close enough to resonance frequency for most people. We'll use low and slow breathing as a guide. We'll practice slow and slow breathing first, and then we'll add in a breath pacer that will pace your breathing at six breaths per minute with four seconds in and six seconds out. To breathe low and slow, we're going to shift the breath from the chest to the belly, take a normal size, comfortable, slow breath in, as if you're smelling a flower. There is no need for a particularly big or deep breath. And then you're going to exhale slowly and fully, either through the nose or through pursed lips, as if you're blowing out a candle. So let's try that together. Breathing in, as if you're smelling a flower, Breathing out as if you're blowing out a candle. In. Out. And adding in a pacer. Breathing in as the ball goes up. Breathing out as the ball goes down. In. Out. In. And out. If this is not feeling entirely comfortable right now, that is okay. You've just gotten a two-minute crash course in something that takes people quite a bit longer to master. With some practice, I promise you this will feel better. I encourage you to practice your residence frequency breathing every day. Start with five minutes a day for a week, then 10 minutes a day for the second week, 15 minutes a day for the third week, and then settle at 20 minutes a day after the fourth week on. Remember, there is no need for perfection. Doing some breath, breath training is always better than none. And there is also no need to breathe at your residence frequency all the time. This breathing skill is reserved for your practice times and for times of increased challenge when you'd like to remind your nervous system to regulate itself. This works just like a strength workout. As long as you get to the gym on a regular basis, you'll maintain gains and continue making progress without having to carry your dumbbells or kettlebells around. And if after a couple of months of uh, working out, your friend asks you to help them move a couch, it will be easier for you to lift that couch. With regular HRV training over several weeks, you'll find that it's easier for you to respond to challenges as they come your way. I started my HRV training over 20 years ago in graduate school, and it's been instrumental in the growth and development of that little girl, too terrified to speak, to me being here with you today. So the next time you find yourself facing a difficult situation, Asking yourself a question, now what? With a couple of months of HRV training under your belt, the answer will be much more easily available. Take a few slow, comfortable breaths at your resonance frequency, remind your body to regulate itself, and face your challenge. Thank you.